Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everyone. My name is Noreen, and I'm an alcoholic. Um, and, uh, I guess I'll start off by saying that, um, my sobriety date is June 25th, 2011. Um, but, um, my very first sobriety date was October 4th of 1987. And I was 25 years old. Um, I was talking to my sponsor last night. And I was talking to her about coming to this meeting in particular. And how I've been coming to this Thursday night meeting on a fairly regular basis for about a year or however long it's been going on. And um, what I have found is that there's a lot of young people that are sharing their story. Um, they're in their early 20s, and um, they come up here and they say what their sobriety date is. They don't always say what their age is, but you know that they're really young. Um, and they have some time, and they've worked the steps. You know, I can relate to everything that they're talking about, even though, you know, I may be 30 years older than they are now. Um, but I can relate to everything that they're saying. Um, and uh, I think about that. And I think about, okay, so I was 25 when I first came into this program. And um, the reason why I came into this program was because I was scared. Um, I had been lying to my sister and her husband, stealing from my sister and her husband. Um... Uh, my drinking was out of control. Um, I was also um, just dry goods, I guess, out of control. And um, I couldn't stop. And I knew that I came from a long line of alcoholics already. I knew that. Um, the one thing I was talking to my sponsor about last night on the phone was, I said, you know, there's all these young people that come into the meeting and they share their experience, strength, and hope. And I think about that, and, I, and when I came back um, and got sober um, a year and a half ago, there was a period of time that I felt like I wanted to fall into that self-pity of, oh, my gosh, if I just stayed sober, I would have been sober 25 years now, okay? But I had a really wonderful, close friend and many women around me say, but especially, Noreen, you had to drink every drink that you drank, take every dry good drug that you took, tell every lie, do everything you did to get where you are right now. My sponsor said last night on the phone, sometimes we get here too soon. And I believe that's what happened to me. I got here too soon. I knew I was an alcoholic when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew I was. And it was one of those things where I... I came from a long line in my mother's side of the family. She was the oldest of 12 children, um, a large Irish Catholic family. My father's family was a smaller family, um, and they were Swiss-German Episcopalian. So um, the sense was, was uh, for some reason, there was a big draw on my mother's side of the family because they were big. There was a, it was a big family. And um, there were nine boys and three girls, and my mom was the oldest. And I grew up on Long Island in a town called Sag Harbor. And when I was growing up in Sag Harbor, it wasn't what it is now. Um, it, was, it was really like a quaint, bucolic seaside town. Um, the summer saw a lot of... Um, tourists and a, a lot of people coming in from the, up the island and the city. And as I grew up and grew older, people that I saw coming out during the summertime I became friends with, I would see them coming on a regular basis. Um, my mother's side of the family, they were very heavy drinkers. And um, I heard it just recently, not too long ago, that it wasn't that drinking was accepted in my family, it was expected. And it was expected. Um, and the thing for me was that I couldn't wait to be accepted in my family because I didn't feel accepted in my family. 
there were so many kids. By the time I came along, my grandmother was tired. I mean, she, I felt like I never really got any kind of attention from her because she had already had so many grandchildren. And I was actually the only child between my parents because both of my parents were married previously and they each had children in their first marriage. And then they divorced. So my mom had two daughters and a son. My father had two daughters. And then I was a product of them. I have a sister that's 13 years older than me. I have a couple sisters that are 13 years older than me. A couple sisters that are 11 year old, years older than me. And a brother that's nine years older than me. Um, growing up, my um, dad uh, was in World War II. And... Um, when he came back from the war, all the money that he had sent his mom, um, uh, his mom had used um, to buy his sister singing lessons and a mink coat. And so when my dad came back, um, uh, he, I asked him one time because he was an alcoholic. And when I was sober at that period of time, when I came in when I was 25, I started asking my family questions. And he's, I said, Dad, you know, why did you ever start drinking? What made you start drinking? he said, well, I'll tell you, you know, I was in the army and I was sending, you know, grandma all this money. And when I came back, you know, she had spent all the money on, you know, my sister. There was a lot of that kind of stuff that went around in our families. <laughs> on my mother's side of the family, um, all of my uncles had served um, in, in one war or the other. All of them had served. One of them actually had gone AWOL. And it was in Vietnam. And, you know, the thing was, was that when I got, when, when I was a kid growing up, and, and, and I'll just try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, when we would go over to my grandmother's house, it seemed like this huge house to me. And we'd go there for all these holidays. And when we would get there, when we would start to you know, get ready to go, we didn't really see our cousins and uncles and stuff on a regular basis, but we lived in a very small town. And the reason for that was because there was always somebody was pissed off at somebody all the time. And there was always something going wrong. My uncles were plumbers, carpenters, um, firemen, never policemen, because they were usually getting in trouble with the law. Um, and there was actually a little jail in the town. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I really think this is funny that they had actually come at one point in time on Halloween night and grabbed my uncle before the night even started and locked him up because they didn't want to have to mess with him later on that night. So that was kind of the reputation my family had. And I was afraid of my uncles. I was really afraid of them because um, I was young. I was six, seven, eight years old. I had a cousin that was my age. We'd go over there for holidays. When we'd get there, things were pretty... You know, everybody was polite, everything was okay, and drinking would start, turkeys were being basted, things were happening, and then as the night would go on, people would be milling in and out, people from the town would come in, and then drinking would get heavier and heavier. And I remember my cousin and I would, like, slip off into this room, we called it the dormitory, and um, it was this big room, and we had... We would start to feel excited and have fun together, and one of my uncles would come in and just, like, bounce at us. What the hell are you guys doing? That kind of a thing. And we would both just, like, freeze. And we felt like we would get in trouble. So that was kind of, like, the pattern it was with my family growing up. There was always this sort of um, sort of um, menacing, sort of uh, something's going to happen kind of thing. My father... Um, Worked at Grumman um, after he had come back from uh, the war. He had actually had a gas station with his father, and they lost the gas station. And so my father um, started working at Grumman Aircraft, which was in Sac Harbor. And they were actually helping to build for the uh, moon thing. Okay. Um, my mom, um, my mom was a nurse. She had uh, gone to school in Brooklyn, she didn't, and she got her registered nursing degree, and um, she worked at Southampton Hospital. So when they um, came together and had me, um, it was not too long after that my father was laid off from Grumman Aircraft. 
Um, and I remember there being some talk of um, my dad having to be hospitalized for alcoholism. But I really don't remember that. I remember that when my mom got really sick and I was afraid to lose her. I, I was The fear of abandonment was really strong. And I remember crying about that. But I never really, I never cried about my dad. So there was a constant, like, um, his, you know, when my dad, when my dad stayed sober, like, um, everything was okay and I could start feeling okay. And then you, I knew the second I walked in the house, I knew if my dad was drinking, it was just a feeling as soon as you walk in the house, you know, so that was sort of the way I was, I grew up. Um, I was not a very good, um, child academically. I was distracted a lot. I was always preoccupied. I was always in fantasy land. I was always trying to, you know, like figure out what everybody else was doing and, and what, what, um, what everybody was talking about, which sort of kind of like went into my adulthood too. Um, in the winter time, our activities were, <laughs> were, um, ice skating and sledding. And, um, the ice skating was great because it was in our neighborhood. The pond was in our neighborhood. And, um, my very first remembrance of taking a drink. Um, I was always, you know, always very, always very nervous little kid. Um, always insecure. Never felt like I had the right answer to anything. If somebody, like, my, I'm named after my mom. So I was five or six years old and we pulled up in front of my grandmother's house one time and then, I was sitting in the car with my mom, and this friend of the family who was, like, walking in through the house or something said, hey, how you doing? And my mother introduced me to this guy. I said, and who are you named after? I, I had no idea. Like, I just was frozen. I was paralyzed with fear. I didn't know what to say to him. And I just kind of, like, smiled. Like, that, I just remember that being so, like, petrifying to me. So, moving ahead, my cousin and I were close in age, and um, I was always trying to get her to do stuff with me. So, um, one of the things that I, I um, became, like, I'll say addicted to early on was sugar. I loved sugar. I loved eating sugar. I loved candy. Obviously, I'm sucking on something right now. Um, but, but, I mean, that was like a way for me to um, not deal with what was going on. I, I did not, like, get into the liquor cabinet until a little bit later, but um, there was always candy in the house, and that was definitely something that I, like, looked to to make me feel differently. I know that now. I didn't know it back then, but I know that now. Um, so, we go to, so we go to go ice skating, and my very first drink is... Hot chocolate with whiskey in it. Okay. So I take a like canister of a thermos of hot chocolate and ask my cousin if we could like take some of the whiskey out of the you know, and so I and it tasted awful. It tasted awful, but it definitely did what I was looking for it to do. And that was to make me feel comfortable, easy and happy and just self confident. And we were ice skating. And I remember Peggy Lipton was very popular at the time. And I remember thinking I was Peggy Lipton. Just kind of like skating around. And, you know, and I was, now, we ran out of that stuff. And I said something to my cousin about wanting more. And she was like, no way. I'm, no, I'm not doing that. So I remember there being kids there with um, beer. And uh, went on from there. Um, I was like 13 years old. And I was at a meeting last night, and this woman said, you know, I remember the first time, like, I started drinking, like, a, a, you know, like a normal 13-year-old. And that's what it was for me. It was at thir I was 13 years old when I started drinking. So, um, from 13 until 25, it got progressively worse. Um, I started getting, um, uh, how can I say it, I had an older sister that would come from Florida to visit and come up to New York, and she would end up taking me with her on her little trips when she would come to visit in New York, and I was so excited um, to be hanging out with her, um, but but she was doing things that she shouldn't have been doing in front of me, and that means, like, driving to a head shop in Southampton, New York, and going in there, and I had no idea what they were doing, and um, but she was babysitting for me. 
I had another older sister that did the same thing. Now, today, you know, I think we're a little bit more aware of what to, what the right thing is to do and what not the right thing is to do. But that's kind of what my environment was. I was I was in and around a lot of people, older people. There was peer pressure, and I so I felt um, uncomfortable, and I wanted to be liked, and I wanted to be accepted. And so whenever I drank, I found myself um, feeling a little more comfortable with myself. Um, when I was in my early 20s, I had, after I had graduated from high school, I'll say this real quick, I came to Tampa, and I lived here for a year with my sister. Um, but things got really bad, because I was when I was living with them, um, they drank every night, and we drank every night. And there were other things that were going on, and I, um, I was young. I was, I was 18 years old, and um, the things, the people that I was hanging around with, and the things that I was doing, um, it, it just, it just seemed like I had arrived in a sense. That this is where I wanted to be. This is what I wanted to have happening in my life. People were older. They were not, you know. I always felt weird around women that and. and guys that were my age. I always liked, you know, being around older people and always, because I felt more accepted somehow. Um, but what happened was the geographical cure where I'm in Florida, I made, I, I lied to a lot of people. I was causing a lot of problems. I was stealing a lot of things from my sister and her husband. And um, I had the opportunity to go back to New York for a visit. And so when I went back to New York, I was going there for three weeks, and I never came back to Tampa. Um, I came back to Tampa about two years later because some time had passed, and I kind of felt like it was okay for me to like, come back, like maybe nobody was mad at me anymore. There was communication. Um, so when I came back to Tampa, it sort of felt like things got a little evened out and a little leveled out, so my sister said, why don't you move back here? Well, when I had been in New York, the drinking and the partying and everything else continued and continued. And um, one time I'd gone to... Um, I chaperoned my nephews on a trip into New York when I when we moved back to New York. And one of my old teachers was on that trip. And he and I started talking. And um, there was something about him. He was really nice. I enjoyed talking to him. And then he asked me if I wanted to have dinner with him. And I was like, okay. You know, uh, it was a little strange. But there was something about him that I liked. Well, come to find out. He was in recovery. And the attraction of his personality is what attracted me to him. Well, my dad, being the alcoholic, I thought maybe he could help me figure out how to get my dad to stop drinking. Um, and the thing was, was that I did, I did, he was significant because he planted a seed for me. Um, I did go out with him for a few times. But it was one of those things, and it was a common pattern with me. If I didn't want to see you anymore, I wouldn't call you anymore. I wouldn't I wouldn't answer your phone calls. Now, we didn't have cell phones then, but I did everything to avoid that person and just pretend like nothing happened. I, I couldn't, like, resolve anything. I couldn't say goodbye. I didn't know how to do that, and I didn't want to. I, didn't, I wasn't aware enough of myself to admit where I was wrong. Well, like... A month after, like, I didn't return his phone calls, a month or two after, I got a letter in the mail from him. And it was a letter of amends. I'd never seen anything like that before. That was another, I, it was, yeah, it was an impression on me that was like, what is this? And he was apologizing for his behavior. I didn't think he'd done anything wrong. But obviously he was mad at me for something. You know, I kind of figured it, that might have been what it was. Um, so, okay, when I moved to Tampa again, I had promised myself that I would not live with my sister and her husband for more than a year, um, that I wanted to get my own place and, like, try and get my act together, and I lived with them for another two years, my drinking and my using got much worse, 
Um, I didn't know my way around Tampa at all. The only places I knew were um, where I lived, the bank, my job, and the Publix up here in Seminole Heights. Um, I finally decided that I would move somewhere, and I found a little apartment, and it was just right up the street from my sister. And um, I was there by myself for two weeks before I hit my first bottom. I had, I had stolen from my sister and her husband again, and um, by this time my brother-in-law, who I care about a lot, um, was, had had it with me wanted my keys back for their house. That following week, I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I knew I needed help, but I, and I didn't know how to stop, and I wanted to stop. I wanted to stop lying. I wanted to stop treating people that I loved the way I was treating them, um, but I couldn't. So I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous on October 4th, 1987, and I picked up a white chip, and I stayed sober without a drink for 12 years. During that period of time, I stayed pretty active in the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had gotten a sponsor. I tried to work the steps. I went to a lot of meetings. Um, but the thing was, is that there was still a reservation for me. Um, I didn't know it, though. I really didn't. Um, I didn't really understand um, the malady of uh, the selfishness and self-centeredness. I wanted so much to have a connection with the higher power, but I didn't understand how to do that. Um, I loved the meetings. I loved the fellowship. I loved it when people would come up to me and, and, and um, say, Hey, how you doing? You look great. I, there were moments where I felt truly that I was doing well. But there was still something inside of me that was missing, and um, I didn't know what that was. Um, I got engaged um, to someone in the program, and um, I was scared the whole time I was with this person. Not scared for my life, but I was just scared. Like, I did not feel comfortable. I didn't feel right. I, there was something not right with it. And, and I, and I in, instead of like really being honest with myself, um, I did my best to like get through it and just try and like understand that this is what a relationship is about and, and it's work and it's hard and oh my god and I was constantly feeling um, angry and I didn't understand my feelings and um, it, it was really uh, unfortunately a very dishonest relationship one thing I did was I um, started and this <laughs> and this is interesting I started doing affirmations. Now, I'm not working a program at this point. I really am not. I'm trying other things except this. I'm not working the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am reading Louise Hay. I am listening to meditation tapes. I am going to Unity Church. I am... Um, uh, writing affirmations all over my house. I am doing all kinds of things outside of myself to try and make me feel better. I am not working the steps. Um, one of the books um, that I used was called The Artist Way. Now, okay, what I wanted to do was I wanted to be an artist. That's was what it was going to be. That's what was going to make me happy. Was if I became an artist and if I got involved in theater, then everything would be okay. Meantime, I'm working full time as a veterinary technician, which I still do. I'm not drinking. I am doing these morning pages every day, and I'm doing them all the time, and I'm feeling better, and something's happening. I'm not drinking. 
um, kind of going to meetings. I was living in South Tampa at the time and um, hanging out at meetings and talking about this and talking about that and finally find myself in a theater. And I'm like, oh, this stuff works. It's working. I'm doing really well. I'm still engaged. Um, the second I walked into that theater and and <laughs> I loved it. The second I walked into that theater, I loved it. It was the Loft Theater up in Fletcher Avenue, and this was almost 20 years ago, and I knew. It was a feeling, it was like the same feeling I got when I walked into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. It was just like, oh, this feels great. Like, this is what I want to do. I'm living with a person that I'm engaged to. Um, this person is working at Care Unit. I don't know if you remember Care Unit. It used to be up there right across from... Um, there at USF um, Treatment Center in, in Florida, in Tampa. And um, things are just still not, like, I'm feeling, I'm not feeling like I'm getting what I need in my relationship, and I'm not feeling like um, this person understands me. And um, I've been going to therapy. And the reason why I started going to therapy, two weeks after I moved in with this person, and we're both in the program, and two weeks after I moved into the in with this person, I was questioning my sexuality. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Because it's a big part of my story. <sighs> okay. So, um, all the time that I was um, living with this person that I was engaged to, um, I was doing my best to um, uh, be a good partner. And... Um, my dad had died when I was four years sober, and a year later, this person and I were still together, and he had proposed to me, and I'll never forget how I felt, like, oh, no, but I didn't know what else to do, and you know why? Because I didn't feel like nobody else would ever ask me to marry them. I just, I didn't know what to do, so I said yes. Well... As time was rolling on, and I'm doing my morning pages, and this person is working at care unit, and they're going to USF, and we're both sort of moving in different directions, um, I meet someone. And um, I knew that I was should not get married. I knew I should not get I knew. But I was kind of backed up into a corner. I didn't know where I was going to go. So it got pretty, it got pretty convoluted. And um, because I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to set boundaries. And I didn't know how to be honest. And I didn't know, um, I was afraid. I was afraid of losing this person. I was afraid of not having this person. I was afraid of me. I didn't know who I was. Uh, and oh my God, you know, what if this is true about me and how, um, how is this going to turn out? And, but, at, but there was a moment of clarity and I remember thinking, you know what, Noreen, no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. No matter what happens, you're going to be okay. Um, I ended the relationship with, um, the person I was engaged to and I began a relationship with this person that I met in theater. I have been with this person that I met in that theater for um, almost 18 years now. Um, we uh, had a commitment ceremony in 1995. I was sober at the time. Um, what happened was I started becoming friends with a lot of people in theater, and I started getting involved in theater a lot. I was not going to meetings anymore. What became important to me was getting recognized in theater, was doing the work, was um, writing. Um, I uh, was no longer important to me about the sobriety. It, 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 I was not praying anymore. I became very difficult to get along with. Um, it was all about me. It was all about me. And um, I would get very jealous because my partner is a director in theater here in Tampa, and she works with a lot of people, and she's very good at what she does. And I would get so jealous. 
<laughs> that she would hire other women to do work. And I wanted to be the one. I wanted to be the one that was working. It was me. Why not me? I mean, we would sit outside the theater and I would cry because you're not picking me. It was like so incredibly painful. Was I sober? I wasn't drinking, but emotionally I was not sober. Okay. So in 1999, I'm 37 years old. I decide I'm going to have a child. I want to have a baby. If I don't try now, my sponsor at the time always said to me, and not that I kept in touch with her very often, but one thing she said to me that stuck with me forever was, still does, if I'm laying on my deathbed, and there's, I don't want to have any regrets about something that I did not try to do. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm 37 years old, I'm feeling like this is about the time, we had somebody that we knew would be willing to help us out, that didn't work out. There's a whole other thing. Somebody called up, stepped up to the plate, and said, we'll help you out. We have a daughter. She's 13 years old. Um, after my daughter was born, um, that's when my relapse started. Um, I was so scared to take any pain medicines that because I was afraid that I was just, it was just going to be all out. That was going to be it. I knew that, that was, if, if I was given those pain medicines, I was not going to be honest about this. I went 24 hours after I had my daughter with a C-section, not taking any pain meds, and then I got this huge gas bubble in my shoulder, and it was so painful. And then they said, you got to take this pain medicine. Don't be a hero. And I was like, okay. Well, the switch got turned on, and I was off to the races. That was it. Now, there were so many other things that I could fill in and tell you about what happened over that span of time, but I'm trying to just get to really the significant things. I didn't tell anybody how I felt. I didn't tell anybody that I liked how I felt. I didn't tell anybody that I was taking drugs. I was lying. Um, and... Um, the thing was, I wasn't drinking, so I was lying to myself, and I pretty much felt like I was still sober. Um, I still attended meetings. I still saw people that I would see on a regular basis, um, and I was lying the whole time. Now, um, I never thought of myself as someone that would do that. Um, I remember when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, smelling alcohol in somebody else's breath when I first came in when I was 25, and I thought, how dare you? How dare you when I'm doing this? Now, I understand what alcoholism is. Um, in 2005, um, my partner, I was going to say my sponsor, my partner was um, doing a lot of travel and doing a lot of work outside of Tampa. Uh, my mother had died in 2003, and that's a whole other story because... That was a very hard loss for me that I would not deal with until I got sober again. Um, it was a period of time that um, I was watching my mom, helping her out. She had dementia, and I had to move her out of her house in Long Island and move her down here. And this was before um, 2005. Um, it was about 2002, I guess. And I uh, moved her down here. And... Um, to sort of give you a picture of what it was like to have her living down here while I have an infant. Um, I had to help her get into the kitchen, into the bathtub, I mean, rather into the bathroom. And um, she was sort of to fall, and she couldn't hold herself up anymore. And as I'm trying to hold my mother up, my daughter is crawling up my leg trying to learn to walk. And so I'll never forget, like, standing there, like, thinking, Oh my gosh, you know, here's my daughter trying to learn to crawl and walk, and here's my mom who can't even stand up. And that was a very significant moment for me. Um, my mother had passed, and um, we bought a house up here in Forest Hills. Um, my mother had left um, some money to each family member after we'd sold the house. 
So when that happened, we bought this house up here. Um, and it was, my daughter was five. Um, it was 2005. And I remember standing in the kitchen, and I was extremely restless, irritable, and discontent. And I was mad. And I missed my mother. And I didn't know who to call. And I knew that there was a bottle of vodka in that freezer. And I knew it was waiting for me. And um, I remember just, you know, looking at my daughter and seeing her, like, little three, five, five years old at the time, yeah. And um, just thinking to myself, how did I get myself into this? How did this all happen? I don't want to be a mom. I can't be a mom. I don't know how to do this. I have no idea what, how I'm supposed to take care of this child. My partner's never home. I don't have anybody. I'm a single mom. You know, I'm just feeling sorry for myself. And so I opened the refrigerator, and I pulled out the bottle of vodka, and I looked at it, and I thought, am I going to do this? I'm going to do it at some point. Am I going to do this now? So I did. And I took a big slug of it, and I didn't feel anything. Took another big slug of it, I didn't feel anything. Took another big slug of it, and, and I felt it. And I, I mean, it was not nice. I was immediately uh, feeling like a beast. Like, there's no going back now, so if you're going to screw it up, you're going to screw it up. And hard. And that's what happened. So, without getting into like, a lot of detail, um, in Bill's story and, um, and what it talks about it in more about alcoholism, um, I can totally relate to now. This is me. It's not the artist's way. It's not Louise Hay. It's the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because for the next five years, I did everything I possibly could to ruin my life, to, um, push my family out of my life, um, to want to give my daughter up for, um, not adoption, but to have my partner adopt her. Because I could not take care of myself, so how was I going to take care of anybody else? And, you know, I would try to, like, um, like, believe and convince myself that, um, uh, I was not a lesbian. I was trying again to tell myself that this was not a part of us because I didn't want to have to deal with it. Um, so he knew how to <laughs> So, thanks. Um, and that was the thing. Like, those were the awarenesses that I, that, that, like, now I know. Like, now I know why I did what I did. But, it's so deep down inside me. Like, I had a dream last night about drinking. It is so subconscious, and it is so deep down and rooted in me that I am an alcoholic, I am who I am, and yet I want to deny every part of that. I don't want to be that. And what do I do? I do everything I possibly can to deny who I truly am. So, um, I have been working um, since 1987 um, uh, for, uh, for a veterinary clinic here in Tampa, and uh, so they've seen me grow up, and one of the doctors um, saw, just knew that, you know, they all, everybody knew that I was just going out of my mind, I like to call it a midlife crack up, because I was 48 at the time when all this stuff was happening, and um, my body was changing, and I was like, I don't, you know, I don't want you anymore, I don't want you anymore, I don't want this anymore, I just want to do what I want to do. And everybody knew that I was heading for trouble. I already headed for trouble. Um, I walked into work um, on a Monday morning um, on June 20th. And um, uh, I'd been out all weekend. Um, called my partner and she said, uh, don't bother to come home. So I didn't. And uh, I went into work. Uh, walked into the office and... The doctor looked at me. He said, I don't know what you're doing, but you're not doing it here. You can either go back and work in the back, or you can go home. And I said, I'll go home. He said, you're not driving. I said, I just drove here. He said, you're not driving. 
Okay. I knew that if I went home, it was not going to be pretty. And I knew this was my opportunity to get the help I needed. Because the whole time that I had been doing what I was doing, every night I would go to bed and I would say, God, please let me wake up sober. God, please let me wake up knowing that I don't have to do this anymore. I couldn't fall asleep because every time I tried to fall asleep, I would get like this big <sighs> in my chest that would just like wake me up. And I would just be like, <sighs> I mean, it was this panic. Um, and every morning when I would wake up, all over again. I mean, it was boom. As soon as I woke up, how am I going to do this again? How am I going to do this again? So I said, um, I need to go to detox. Well, you know, the people I work with don't know what detox is. They had no idea what I was talking about. It's like, there's a place in town and country. It's called town and country hospital. That's where I need to go. A couple of things. And these were like little um, uh, other significant things that happened. First one was um, prior to this. Um, after I'd had Sydney, I uh, have the woman who actually offered to help us out with her husband. She also had a child um, just six weeks after Sydney was born. So Sydney actually has a half sister. Well, she too had drugs, um, and so I made it a habit to make sure I knew when she was getting her prescriptions filled. She knew that something was going on because she was finding that her prescriptions were low. And one thing was I went into her house one day, and I pulled out her bottle, opened it up, and inside was a message. And it said, you must stop. She didn't know it was me. She just put a message in there for somebody, whoever it was. The next message that I got was, I'm talking to my daughter, and I'm thinking, you know what, Sydney, um, Mama Carla and I aren't really getting along very well, and I really think it's time for me to move. And she's like, no, Mom, and she's like eight years old. And uh, she says, no, Mom, I was, I was like, then, and she said, then I won't see you. And I said, that's not true. You can see me. She said, no, I wouldn't want to see you. Two things that were really significant that I wanted to just, like, pretend didn't happen. The third thing that happened that was right before I ended up going into detox was my father-in-law, I call him my father-in-law, had open-heart surgery. I would go to pick up my daughter at his house, at their house, his mother and father-in-law, and I'd go in his bathroom and um, help myself. And uh, everybody knew something was going on with me. So the next time I go, I do the same thing. And um, a couple, three days later, he shows up at my house. He says, Nurina, I have to talk to you. She sa he said, that wasn't what was in those pill bottles. I put vitamin D in there because I knew something was going on. And he had a heart to heart talk with me. Okay. Besides having to claim bankruptcy during this period of time with my partner, besides having to go to detox, when I went to detox, my partner found a place for me to go far away to get the help I needed. She didn't want me to stay in Tampa because she was afraid if I stayed in Tampa, I wouldn't get sober. And she was right. I went really far away. It was still in Florida, but it was far away. I could spend a whole hour again talking about what it was like being in treatment and what it was like going to outpatient at Turning Point because that is where the miracles really started happening for me. It took me three weeks when I went into treatment to wake up and to like realize this was serious. I needed to really get to work. I was so burned. My body, I could not think straight. I didn't know what to do. I felt very alone. Um, 
I got through treatment. I picked up a white chip on June 25th over in Port St. Lucie, Florida. And um, I came home on August 16th of 2011 after 54 days of being over in treatment there. When I came back, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know if I was going to be with my family. I had already broken their hearts. I had already told them I didn't want them anymore. But I needed a place to come home to. I remember saying to my partner many times when we would fight, I remember saying to her, you will never, ever forgive me. And she would say to me, but you haven't given me a chance. Now, she's never read this book, but in Two Wives, there's a lot of stuff in there that she knows intuitively, which has helped me tremendously. The family afterwards helped me tremendously when I came back. I would read that chapter and see things there that made so much sense to me because it was no longer about getting stuff and it was no longer about the self-importance and it was no longer about the material things. It was about staying sober and being grateful for what I have and loving what I have. There's a prayer that I will say and I, I said it actually tonight when I pulled up. And it's a prayer that really, when I, if I had to list everything with it, each sentence, there would be many things I could list. But it's as simple as, Dear God, thank you for all you have given to me. Thank you for all you have taken from me. And thank you for all you have left me with. And there's a lot of wonderful things that my higher power has left me with. And that's what it says in the in the book here about the family afterwards. Because I wanted everything on the outside of me to be different. I didn't want anything that I thought it, I had in my life. I didn't think anything in my life meant anything to me. But it says in the family afterwards, and I'm not going to try and find it right now, but it says... The circumstances in our household are the same as they were when we were drinking, and that is as it should be. And when I saw that and read that, that felt like a promise to me to know that if those circumstances were as they should be right now, then I have hope that I can go ahead and live and love and accept these circumstances, and this is what God wants from me. I'm done. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.